Hello and welcome to Cinema Cyber for a brand new movie review. It's myself, George, and I'm joined by Chris. Apologies to anyone that did catch the beginning of the stream about 20 minutes ago. We had to restart due to some technical issues, so that has now been resolved. Um, but we are here to talk about One Man and His Shoes, which is a new documentary based on the Air Jordans sort of phenomenon, the shoe range. Um, and it's our second film, London Film Festival, which is worth mentioning. Chris covered Mogul Moglai on Friday. And we've got plenty more reviews coming across the week. And similar to Friday, this is a film where I've just seen, not Chris today. So we've got role reversal for this one. And we were very fortunate enough to get an early copy of the press screening. Uh, the public, the, sorry, the press screening is on Wednesday the 13th, I believe. However, uh, I'm going to try to drop the news, Chris. Drop some interesting yeah, news. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it now. Yeah. Um, so I've been very fortunate to find out we're going to get an interview with the director of this documentary, uh, Yemai Barimo, who has directed this film. That is going to take place over the next day or so, and it will get uploaded onto the channel as soon as we have everything confirmed and it's all good to go. So we're looking forward to that. And if you want to find out when that is going to drop, the best place, as usual, to always find us is on the social medias, which is Cinema Savvy on Facebook and at Cinema underscore Savvy on Twitter. So that's pretty fun. Hopefully, we've got more interviews we can do across the channel. Uh, we're obviously not going to say anything unless we've got anything confirmed, but this is one very much looking forward to. And this is one of the films, I guess, in the London Film Festival I was looking forward to the most, and that's based off the recent TV series The Last Dance, which many people may be familiar with. I don't know. Did you end up watching that? I can't remember. Um, no, you told me a lot about it. I still, it's still on my list of ones to watch. Um, I, I fear that my only knowledge of, because I'm not a, like a massive sports guy. I know obviously of Michael Jordan. My, my knowledge of Michael Jordan begins and ends at Space Jam, unfortunately, at the moment. But I know that you did see the um, the documentary and it, it's meant to be, you know, like this really big, prolific documentary film. Um, and although this isn't like a sequel this isn't like in any way affiliated with that documentary it is almost like a nice sort of spiritual successor with them both coming out within the same year i guess um this going more into i think what you told me about the whole um obsessive sort of collector side of things and the merchandising and the very very dark territories that that can lead to um so it, it's your turn to get interrogated today uh, when we get into this review but um do you think it helped having watched that documentary? Did that kind of, because I haven't watched that. That's probably more on the life of Michael Jordan itself. This is definitely more from sort of the merchandising of the Air Jordans themselves. Do you think it sort of helps having both of those sides to it coming together as one whole when you did watch this documentary film? I It's quite a weird one because I'm like you. I mean, I knew of him. I'd seen Space Jam. Um, I went to Chicago last year. I didn't go to the Bulls Museum. So looking back, it's kind of like, well, that was a, a really wasted opportunity. But um, Last Dance helped because the documentary is kind of um, split in three. You have the origins of the brand, how they got the commercial deal, how important it was, how they began to market it. And that's something that the the documentary series covered really well on Netflix. However, they didn't have an interview with one of the people that was on this, which is very bizarre for Netflix's standards because he was one of the Nike consultants that helped create and develop the brand. So a bit of a unknown quantity there. But... I certainly think it helped. The first or third, I felt like I knew I knew what was going to be said next, and I don't think that's anything at fault. I think these were just been in production at similar times. Mm -hmm. However, the the sort of the, the certainly the, the latter part where it goes into the collectors, the obsession, interviewing collectors themselves, I thought that was one of the most um, not impressive feats of the documentary because I think it's fine. You do need this kind of collective to go with it, but as someone. Um, I can't say I'm a shoe collector. I know you're not, but we both kind of go for autographs. So we're familiar with the mm -hmm. sort of the typical collector as such, especially when it involves going out to shops, to streets, to get to places. You know, we do our conventions within red carpets. And I think across many collectors and standpoints, you are going to get these obsessive, here's this beautiful collection with over a thousand shoes. Um, being insured for over a million dollars, which is incredible when you hear them talking about in the film. And as someone that has done collecting and other things, it's really cool to look at that. But then you do need to, I think, have that dark side of, you know, it's great that we get these shoes. However, people's lives have been lost over a pair of shoes. Mm -hmm. And I think that comes with the territory that documentaries aren't something we get to review much on the channel. It, it's a really fascinating genre because I never, you don't get, I, I mean, it's, it's more my fault. It's like the whole foreign film back where, I haven't seen enough of them, and every time I watch them, I tend to really enjoy myself watch with them. But it's it's something that it, it's nice to watch once in a while, and 
I think when it's willing to look at both the positives and negatives of something, I think that adds a far more unique sort of take on it that it hasn't been this sort of pro, you're going to watch this documentary and buy a load of Air Jordans after because you could, and it's very easy to, just like it was of Last Dance, but this also has, you know what, maybe you should take a step back and have a think at this. Um, I don't know if I answered that too well, but I think Last Dance, they work hand in hand with each other because Last Dance is, you know, he's one of the greatest players ever. His, I think it was eight episodes in the end on his career. They dedicated sort of three quarters of one episode to the shoe brands, which was quite important, um, especially at the time of it. So there were some things that crossed over. Some of the interviews they had with some of the same uh, I forgot forgotten his name, but it was Michael Jordan's former agent. They had uh, Howard Stern, who was like he was head of NBA from 1984 to 2014. That's a massive name to get on a documentary. And I was pleasantly surprised that for a certainly for a British production of a documentary focused on sort of shoe culture, and you know it does exist over here, but it's not at the the status it is in America and never has been. And that could be the same as as many type of collectors. Certainly, merchandising America always has that, that instigation. But coming from sort of a British director, I thought quite made it interesting that it's it's going to try and, I think, sell it to the people that don't know this culture. So I don't know much about shoes until I watch that stance. And this is great because the opening titles of this, it's a uh, it's like a montage of his, real life history and American history from the sort of the 80s through to the 90s, as well as Michael Jordan stuff. You know, when you want to watch them films and you can go in not knowing anything about Michael Jordan, mm-hmm. about not knowing about the shoes or anything, and you can go in and the first five minutes puts you where you need to be for the documentary to kickstart. And I thought that was a really fascinating way of doing that because it isn't something that's easy to sell to people, I want to say. You know, people have heard of him. Certainly this year, I, I think it's made it more popular that it's an even smarter choice to be, whether or not this was filmed last year or the year before, but I think with the way this year's gone and what we've had with the Michael Jordan stuff and the fact it's the NBA playoffs currently, I think it's really good timing for to be shown over in the UK. Yeah, so it sounds like it's quite an accessible documentary that you mentioned that anyone can, like a person who knows nothing about it like me could easily tune into it, watch it and come away with something at the end. In terms of how it's structured, um, is it a sort of, of a clear sort of act one and act two structure where it, it establishes the brand and... Um, the need for them, the commodity of them, and the prolific quality of them, and then the second half goes more in towards that darker side to it, or is the darker side kind of sprinkled all the way through? Does it have a, um, is it telling a narrative essentially, or does it set up and then goes into that more of a somber conclusion towards the end? Um, I would say it's more of a sucker punch. So they've built the film up so well. They built the brand, how, how we got it from A to B, you know, they're bringing Spike Lee, they show a lot, of, they've got a lot of old school footage, which is worth mentioning, and um, the the design, you know, in documentaries when they show like old newspaper clippings and stuff like that, they go for a really unique sort of modern take on it, where they have the clipping, but they've obviously got someone that's been developing animations to go with it, so it looks very stylized in the 80s, it looks like there's like film flickering over it, so it has the right feel to it, which I think builds up, but it's smart because it reaches the point where you're getting the Spike Lee uh, a TV advert, but I think he replies a character from one of his old films because um, he wears Jordans. I think it, oh, I forgot the name of it. It's behind me on my shelf. Um, do the right thing. Um, so it has his character, and I knew about the Spike Lee adverts. I knew it would have been a big thing. And what the documentary is, it built it so high. So I said, you know, this is how great the demand is. This was how incredible smart the marketing was. It was great marketing. Everyone copied it. You know, it, it showed as well that they develop, they go into these sort of uh, the, the basketball where you've had some basketball players in the past who were uh, advertised sort of like white people were, uh, if that makes sense, that they'd have them in their suits and they kind of mentioned the era that you had Prince, you had my, uh, Michael Jackson, you had Michael Jordan being a bigger merger from this, you had Eddie Murphy as well, and it, it brings in the culture of these individuals that stood up from the rest because they, they took their own marketing paths in the products they made and how they went about doing them, which I thought was quite an interesting take. And then it builds up to this cliff note. It builds up to the, this is how positive collecting is. And then just hits you. And it's like, you know, this is a Sports Illustrated magazine from 1990. And it goes into a, the, the 15-year-old was, I've got it actually written here because it's actually horrible. A 15-year-old was strangled to death by a 17-year-old two weeks after um, a new pair of Jordans was released. And that's 1989. And the Sports Illustrated magazine you know, they have people reacting to it back then saying, you know, did this harm the brand? What do people think? And it's kind of not left unambiguous, but then you very much quickly realize that this is actually going to go into the stuff that 
other places would be too afraid to go into. So it then starts going to, it, you know, the kind of classic montage of like news reports. Mm-hmm. It's got like videos of like people queuing overnight to get shoes, doors being ripped off, um, fights. It cuts to a CCTV footage of someone standing outside a shop and then four people jump in, batter him. And then you just see, you just see someone pull his shoes off at the end and run. And it's because they wanted the shoes the entire time. So it goes into that side of things, which I think does need to be shown because it's so easy to make a documentary where you, you want, as I said, buy the pair and keep wearing them because it's smart. It's this, they're great. They're a cultural sort of status. Mm-hmm. But then it's to realize that, you know what, shoes aren't that important. And it's phenomenal, the brand and how they've done all the marketing. But it's the, so I sort of mentioned before we went live, the sort of bears no responsibility to it. Of course, it's it's not Nike or Michael Jordan's fault about what happened in mm-hmm. regards to people being murdered and stuff. But when a company's hyper-marketed something for 30 years, and there's been deaths for 30 years, and their marketing strategy has always been to market, 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 and then when release date comes, they know they've never made enough to meet demand. That's their intention because it creates the aura of we've got to now come back every week until there is stock. It sort of goes into that questioning whether, you know, morally could could the brand have done something else to have resulted in less deaths because they interview a mother of someone that died, which is really um, it's quite a touching scene. And they were saying this was this video was online of her son being murdered for the shoes, and he, he was bought some shoes in the morning. Four people came to his car, to give us the shoes, and he tried to drive off. They shot him. Um, the car goes into a house because obviously he's at the wheel. And it just shows the the wheel of the car still running for like five minutes straight because mm-hmm. obviously what's happened. And the mom sort of says, you know, I, he, my son was never the first one to die from this. I can only hope that he was the last one. And unfortunately, that isn't the case. And mm-hmm. I don't know if I've made this too dark or given away too much too quickly, but I feel that it does a really easy way. If it's sprinkled in negative stuff, they make sort of passing comments before that, you know, when the first pair came out in 85, you couldn't get any for the first two months. And then they were available everywhere. And it was one of them where you, they build up these sort of, uh, you get it everywhere these days with like Pop Funkos and stuff like that. They'll make it so limited, it has this black market, even in the pre eBay days. And then suddenly it's available everywhere and it's worth nothing. I and mean, obviously it's worth stuff now, but in 85, people have had no issue. They'd waited three months. Kind of like the PS5s we're looking at today, you know, PS5s are out next month. No one was able to get pre orders. If you got them, you were very lucky. But it's created this black market online where they're going for two grand and could there be people that get robbed on release? Yeah, I wouldn't absolutely. Put it past anyone Definitely. wouldn't put it yeah. past it. Um, so I think that answers that bit. But I, I thought it was a very smart way of, of go, going into that topic without making it obvious from the get go. Some people may think it comes across as having an agenda. I don't think so. I think it's just such a fair job of balancing. You've got these sort mm-hmm. of goes to uh, someone's house in Paris, someone in Tokyo. Uh, obviously a couple of people in America and you've seen these amazing collections and they are great to see it. It does show how great collecting can be. And it shows these individuals and what they, what they have. There's a guy that said um, he got his first ever pair in 85 and he's worn them on new year's day. Well, he wears it one day a year, every year. And they're like pristine, perfectly mm-hmm. put away. And I love seeing things like that because there's someone that has done collecting of other things. And I can't sit here and lie. I've got like three pairs of Jordans. Um, two of them came straight after last dance, which again, was there a subconscious thing that, you know, you didn't have to buy Jordans when that documentary came out, but if you're going to see eight episodes of TV about how great he is, how great the shoes are, how comfy they are, how everyone has them, it, it incentively adds something to your head to want to get a pair, and they are very comfy, which is what I always say. I actually love wearing them. But, um, mm-hmm. yeah, I don't know if that covers that bit. Sorry. Yeah, the, the last question I was sort of going to ask you was more about sort of Yemi Bamiro himself. So I actually, I, I guess both of us haven't watched any of his previous stuff before. Apparently he's done a lot of shorts before. He has sort of um, done a few documentaries before. I'm just reading here. There's one called Reggae Fever. Um, there's one called um, Black Renaissance, uh, Reggae Yates in Hollywood. Um, but apparently this is according to BFI um, website here. It says that this is his first uh, debut feature documentary of this scale. Does this, I mean, it is a documentary film and I think it's very difficult with documentary. It's not impossible to sort of break the mold. Does it fit into sort of a very typical style for a documentary or in terms of like a direction standpoint, is there, are there any kind of style choices in there that are particularly different or eye-catching when it comes to documentaries does it feel different or is it very much akin to what you would expect from a documentary i i think this felt fresh 
Um, it felt, oh, I hate the word using the word cultured, but when it has these sort of, the, the montage of newspapers and uh, ad adverts and, you know, they'll be, they'll have a, almost like a pendulum circling the shoes of these famous people wearing them to catch you off. And I think it keeps you invested within the documentary because it's so easy to go to. I mean, they do do this at a couple of occasions, more so when they're in person, which is what I understand. You know, uh, with a documentary, you'll watch it. And then what they've done, they've got them talking all day. And then they'll just put B-roll footage of them holding the shoes somewhere in the house. I mean, I've been going doing that when I've done them in the past. And it's absolutely fine. That's a traditional way. But when they were discussing with these, you know, these big people, like, you know, head of NBA for 30 years, sports journalists that's covered basketball for years, when they're able to animate around that, it, I think it just made it nice. So you'd have like a like a black background, the key, the key, maybe like a poster there, a poster there, and it will like zoom in, and there'll be like star patterns emerging, and then it will move on to the next piece. It it has this really nice animated flow where sometimes a documentary is easy to look away. You can go on your phone because the, sometimes the key part is listening, but this mm -hmm. visually has something to keep you attached to it, and for something that's so similar to the the Netflix documentary production standpoint, it felt very different. It felt in terms of it kept you going because obviously, you know, the um, Netflix is Netflix. It's the, the, the biggest streaming service in the world. It had a, whatever budget they had, they had Michael Jordan involved in it. Yet this one of course is done via the BFI. It's, it's, it's an independent documentary. And I thought the production values were, were great and it, it felt new on a documentary. And it's because I haven't seen his other work and I want to go and see them now. Uh, I believe one, not of his, but Alma Haral, who did Honey Boy, who was fantastic. She started in documentaries. Uh, she saw Bombay Beach and Shai Labouf contacts her off the back of that to make Honey Boy. I think documentaries is a really interesting way for these artists to come through their careers. And I think I'd seen that he's got a, um, like a show reel online, which I had a look at. I've not seen any of his full work. He's done sort of TV documentary work. And it to me, it's quite a big jump going to a feature length documentary, but certainly from a British perspective on the American, certainly mm. an American centralized industry um, because, you know, you can get them over here, but you don't get the stock, you don't get the hype, you get the reselling, but you don't get stuff like that. I mean, I couldn't imagine, I don't think it's ever happened over here where people perhaps murdered trying to get shoes, but the way it plays in the documentaries, it's so common in America, which always goes back to from our overseas perspective as how horrifying gun, guns are, you know, anyone can have them and this film it, it hits you harder it's like you know this was one one person's life well not one many people's lives lost each over a pair of shoes and it's insane and it's the retail well, it's the western culture I, right <laughs> that's if that's yeah, the it's, western it's, culture <laughs> it's like capitalism it's finest and it, it's crazy and it's sad as well because and that's why i watched this and i did sit thinking i know it's not on jordan i know it's not on nike however one thing that hit me hard, I'm going to read out something I took from this. Um, the sister of, of the, the sort of case that they focus on, they, they, they're they talking to her and she goes, oh, yeah, Michael Jordan sent me a pair of shoes after my brother died. And you know when you can tell it's something that they didn't know because the director jumps in, you can hear him behind the camera saying, what is in Michael, the Michael Jordan? She goes, yeah. Mm -hmm. She said, they, he sent me a new pair of Jordans and they hadn't been released yet, so I didn't want to wear them until, well, I couldn't wear them basically until after the shoes were released. And she wanted to wait a month after because she was scared that if someone saw her wearing these unreleased Jordans, she could be a target. And I think that's what hit me a little bit more because you can see that easily. Mm -hmm. It's the, oh, look, no one's seen them before. They must be new. Oh, no. Then someone else says, oh, they're not out yet. And you become a target. And I, it's quite painful because, you know, of course, Jordan and Nike are aware of these murders, but just to send some shoes is quite. I don't know. I'm not saying it's a cold gesture, but it, it seems it's quite... expensive, doesn't it? It seems it yeah, makes like... me wonder: was he privy to like everything that was going on, or did he not know? Was stuff swept under the rug? Was it publicists or whatever? It, you don't know. It could be a whole bunch of factors at play, really. But it, it it does bring in ever so slightly some of that kind of stuff where they talk about Jordan um, at one point in his career where. He'd never, I don't want to sound this, I don't want to phrase this wrong, but essentially with Jordan, he's never sort of, he's always been an individual, he's always been a brand, but he's never been that individual pushing for racial equality and things like that. I'm, I'm trying to hope I've not phrased this insensitive, mm. but certainly Last Dance goes into it where 
there was this big hoorah in the nineties because there was something happened. I can't remember what. And this is why went why went you um you know when uh, it comes to election time and all these mm. celebrities endorse someone, he wouldn't endorse someone, and he was caught saying, "Well, the other political party buy my shoes too." And he's been, I mean he was criticized that in the nineties and he is a you know as far as a businessman goes without doubt one of the most successful businessmen in history. His agent said if we'd have known what the Jordans would have done. We'd have took a one one p a year salary and asked for fifty percent commission because we would have got that, and obviously he ended up getting sort of uh, I think five million years for five years plus uh, royalties. Um, I mean, this day and age, I think it's worth mentioning that last year the Jordan brand took in over three billion. Um, he makes one hundred thirty million year of his shoes, considering he's been retired for over fifteen mm-hmm. years. The second highest is LeBron James, who most people have probably heard of. He's also going to be in the new Space Jam. And Space Jam, yeah. Like, I was going to say, yeah, yeah. It's, all, it's all connected with Space Jam. <laughs> and it's like, and he gets 30 million a year and he's current. He's a current player. And it, I think it just shows the level of, of how much. And you just got to take into account, I think, as a kind of final thought that it not only shows how great Jordan was, it's a great line when they say that every time Jordan won a championship, that Jordan brand became more valuable by the day. Absolutely, yeah. And, you know, he's not doing it for the brand, he's doing it for himself, but he's a smart business guy. Like, he knew exactly what he was doing. And I think going back to what you mentioned earlier about sort of watching Last Dance with this, I'd be very fascinated to have seen this, then Last Dance. Mm. Um, I did love the Last Dance. I think it did balance the good of the bad. Uh, it, it did go into some of the more personal stuff of him that he wasn't sort of the best with, and he's quite honest in that approach. But I, I, overall, I thought this documentary was a really um, kind of fun addition to that, having a little bit of inside knowledge before, being on the other end of collecting and being able to come out and saying, okay, now I've seen this dark side of another type of collecting. It's kind of really fascinating to behold, and I'd like to sort of read more into it. And I'm sure there is a lot more to read into things like this. There's a lot more case studies, and you know, for every great story you'll hear about someone that did well to get their shoes on release day within 10 minutes, and or we got the Travis Scott Jordans, which are worth a grand within three months and stuff. And it's kind of like, you know, people have been murdered, they continue to be murdered, and that's the key. It's not someone was murdered, it's they continue to be murdered. And I think that left a a very big sort of impact on me and i think that's what you need of documentaries you don't want to you don't want to do it by the numbers easy one two three you want oh, gotcha. you want an yeah. impact being left with you and i think it delivered with that well i could ask more questions we could keep this conversation going however um i want you to save your questions and more explanations yeah. about it for uh tomorrow uh you have the interview with yemi bermiro tomorrow um that is going to be recorded on zoom i believe and then i don't know when we'll get a copy we'll get a copy and it'll be on the channel but that'll be a really good conversation uh nice i think it's like a 20 minute sit down chat with him so that'll be really good some good conversation topics there so that is another one off the film festival list uh we have so many more coming over the next couple of weeks and uh in fact we'll ha- probably have one tomorrow i know for a fact that i'm watching one tomorrow uh can't remember the name of it we've, we've got a whole list of ones that we're watching but uh this is the best place to keep you know, to subscribe to, to follow on Facebook, Twitter, all of that good stuff, because we will be covering a lot of them. Um, We are going to be getting through a lot of them. Uh, Me, you, Tate is going to be jumping on. Tate's watching a whole bunch as well. So we will have some of the big three of us uh, conversations as well. So yeah, one final blast through the socials um, before we round off today. So as always, uh, George, you're going to have to do it for me, I think. Uh, You can follow us on Facebook at Cinema Savvy. If you just go on there, type it in, you'll find us on there. Twitter is Cinema underscore Savvy. And um, yeah, we also have a public link as well. If you do want to pick up any merch, um, you can find a link to that in the description down below. That'll do it from us. Uh, Big thank you to Carl in the comments who was watching this review as we went through with it. Big thank you for the support. And uh, we'll see you on the next review. Take care, everyone.